Also, Danny Gregg will be speaking, our PMD of both Midland and Gladwin counties. Now a family physician, but still works part-time in the emergency room. So thank you very much, Danny. All right, everybody hanging in there this morning? All right, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, field activation mostly, and then we're gonna go through some practice cases, which are always fun. Um, STEMI initiative, the STEMI alert team, started about four years ago. Uh, I basically started with EMS's initiative. We had a couple of ED nurses involved. Uh, right now we have 34 people involved, multi-departmental. Um, everyone's done a great job and is continuing to grow. Um, this multiple facilities and counties. We've got Midland, Gladwin, Clare, Houghton, Bay even, anywhere else? Okay, yep, okay. Farwell, Ogama, okay. We were the first uh, in the state of Michigan with an approved STEMI protocol. That happened in 2011, and that was quite a struggle. Um, trying to get anything past the state these days requires quite a bit of an effort. Uh, we got, n literally got notes back from them like, you know, the heparin bolus. Um, show us data that proves that the heparin bolus in the field is more effective than the heparin bolus in the ER. Well, there is no such data. This is existing standard of care. I mean. There's no data that says aspirin in the field is more effective than aspirin in the ER either. It's just what we do. So finally, after a while, we, we've got this through and uh, we're proud to get it done. Um, we have very committed cardiologist in Dr. Lauer, a bold champion uh, who I think has dragged the other cardiologists uh, to his way of thinking. Um, we do immediate notification and review of all STEMI patients uh, to any team members that were involved. We're trying to get as accurate data collection as possible. That's one of the things we're going to talk about that we do struggle with to some degree. We give immediate follow-up to uh, all medics and all field personnel involved. Um, we used to wait for pictures and things, but we've decided we just want to get the info back to them, let them know what, what happened, how things turned out. Continuing education like we're doing today and public education. This is what's supposed to happen with a walk-in STEMI patient. Uh, and we generally do a very good job of this. Uh, this applies mostly to our outlying uh, facilities. Um, patient presents to an emergency department with acute coronary syndrome signs and symptoms. Uh, he gets his 12 lead hopefully within five minutes. Uh, the idea is if it shows a STEMI, we activate EMS right away for emergent transfer. Uh, if door in to out, door out time cannot be arranged in less than 30 minutes, or if the transport time to Midland is going to be greater than 60 minutes due to weather or anything else, then the patient becomes a candidate for thrombolytic therapy and still transferred to the PCI center. At the outlying facility, they will prepare the patient for transfer, IV, aspirin, nitro, heparin bolus, all those other things. Uh, they're not going to give any Plavix or Effiant uh, or Berlinta or any other antiplatelet agents before the transfer. And they're going to fax the 12 lead right to us in the ER. Uh, and then they're going to call me and they're going to say, I've got a STEMI patient, uh, EMS is here, or maybe the patient has already left. I mean, maybe EMS brought the patient in and they say, hey, this is a STEMI, and they put them right on the rig. We do not delay transfer for the call. We're not giving them permission to transfer the patient. We're going over the case and deciding whether or not to activate the lab. So they fax us the 12 lead. They say, it looks like an inferior MI to me. I'm sending the patient. OK, great, send the patient. We look at the fax. As long as we agree, we activate the cath lab through the Midland ER, and things go as though the patient had walked through our doors or you guys had, had activated from the field. If we disagree with the interpretation of the 12 lead, we may call it off and have them come to the ER. If we do not get the 12 lead because of technology, because there's a lousy printout on the fax that's uninterpretable to us, we go with the read from the outlying ER doc. The cath, the cath lab is still activated and you still go. And then of course the five minute call before you get here. Can't stress how critically important that is so that you know where to take the patient. Nothing's going to be worse than showing up in the cath lab without a cath team there. New onset left bundle branch block. We just been a, a year, two years. We've been talking about uh, being able to activate on this. Um, you guys don't activate, but 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 we we may. Um, your responsibilities are to get the 12 lead. Uh, you look at the patient. 
patient looks like someone who's having an MI. That's one of the critical things for the left bundle. So this, this guy has got chest pain, he's diaphoretic, you know, um, he just looks like a cardiac patient to you. You look at his EKG, he's got a left bundle branch block. So you're gonna call your medical control in your community and say, I really think this guy's a cardiac patient, can I bypass and go to Midland? They're gonna say yes. The hope is that they're also gonna look through old records and see if they can find an old EKG on this guy. Um, you're also gonna call us and call the ER nurse and I'm gonna look through Muse and see if I can find an old EKG. If we can document that this is a new left bundle, this guy will go to the cath lab with consultation with cardiology. If we can't document that this is a new left bundle, uh, it's really gonna depend a lot on the situation. So if you have a 91 year old guy who's had two bypasses and five stents, and now he's got a little bit of chest pain and it looks like maybe something's going on, probably not gonna activate on that guy. That left bundle is not likely to be new. If he's 50 years old with no past medical history and he's got crushing chest pain and a big ugly left bundle, we may just send him without any old, without any old EKG. So that's gonna be a judgment call between myself, my partners, and the cardiologist on the call. This is the checklist that we uh, would like the ERs to complete. Um, oral report given to the cath team, PCI worksheet completed, copy of the 12 lead with patient identification given to staff, pre-hospital labs labeled and taken to the laboratory, paramedic agency involved, um, we, down here we talk about question nuance at left bundle, we just talked about that. Right bundle with ST elevation, I think Kevin touched on the idea that uh, right bundles we can interpret just the same way we would someone without a bundle branch block. Initially the rule was back in 2011, any bundle branch block and we didn't activate. You guys have all done such a good job that we decided we'd expand the criteria. So now as long as you can find your baseline, you can activate on right bundle branch block with ST elevation as if, as if it was any other patient. Is the entrance still OB or do we have a new entrance? Still OB. All right, so on to a few case studies. None of these are terribly difficult, but it's always a good idea to review. These are all real people, uh, so none of these are, are made up. Um, you dispatch to a Oh, and hopefully this will be interactive, uh, which, so I'd like you to uh, tell me what you think of the EKG and what you do. Normally interactive means I pause for a minute and then give you the answer myself, but hope, hopefully someone will take a look and say something. Uh, you're dispatched to a 240 pound, 52 year old male complaining of being awakened by mid-sternal chest pain. 10 out of 10, blood pressure's good, pulse is good, O2 sat's good, skin's a little clammy, lung sounds are clear. Within five minutes, you have the following EKG. Is that projecting okay? Yeah. All right, good. Okay, all right. So, what's your decision? Activate, right. So you're gonna call us and you're gonna activate, okay. Which coronary artery is involved? Which, which, uh, which region is involved? Inferior wall, which coronary artery? So your job is to look at this and see ST elevation in 2, 3, and ABF. Call us and say, I've got ST elevation, I've got a patient with classic signs and symptoms, I'm activating the cath lab. If you tell us there's elevation in 2, 3, ABF, it's an inferior MI, we'll be impressed. If you tell us there, there's elevation in 2, 3, and ABF, I have an inferior MI and a likely acute occlusion of the right coronary artery, we'll be impressed, but we also might think you're a little bit annoying. <laughs> Next case, you're dispatched to an 88 year old male complaining of chest pain while mowing his grass with a push mower. 5 out of 10, again good blood pressure pulse, skin is pale and diaphoretic, lung sounds are clear bilaterally. EKG here. Yeah, so he's got a little bit of a little bit of anterolateral, maybe a little bit of elevation inferiorly. Where's the pointer? So you could you could maybe argue that he's up a little bit in into ABF, mostly mostly out here laterally, right? Pointer's dead now too. There we go. All right. Um, so what what region is that? 
anterior lateral kind of, yep, good. Which artery? The big one, right? Yeah. LAD? <laughs> the Widowmaker, right. <laughs> Air dispatch to a 210 pound. Notice these real world, ca real world cases uh, and the uh, body habituses in these people. Uh, it's always kind of funny when I look at the 4,000 unit maximum bolus. So you may give less than that in all of our 60 kilogram acute MI patients, but otherwise you'd probably be given the 4,000 unit bolus almost as a standard, right? Um, so you're dispatched to a 210 pound, 62 year old male with heaviness in his chest and left arm pain after physically exerting himself outside. Classic story. 10 out of 10. Went into rest, but the pain did not go away. Sounds like maybe he's had episodes of this in the past where it did go away. Huh? Uh, blood pressure 104 over 62, pulse 50. O2 sat's good. He's pale and diaphoretic. Lung sounds are clear. Pulse is a little weak. You get this EKG right away. Inferior, are you activating on this? Yeah. yeah absolutely. Vessel? Right. You got it. And he died. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> you knew this guy. Yeah. 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 Did he get a fluid bolus on the way in? Yeah. He yeah. Allowed, he allowed some. Yeah. Yeah. So these inferior guys, this is something you got to be careful with. You give them the nitro and the blood pressure just drops out of sight and then you got to give them fluid bolus. They, you got to keep that, uh, keep that right atria full. You're dispatched to a 150-pound, 88-year-old male complaining of chest pain. Five out of 10, blood pressure, pulse, O2 sat, all good. Skin color is normal, lung sounds are clear. In 17 minutes, you get the following EKG. Not as, not as obvious, I hear inferior. Is that what everyone's seeing? Yeah, yeah. Um, Anything about this EKG that makes that makes you think that inferior is a little little more real than than he's got some reciprocal changes across the precordium, doesn't it? So you're going to activate on this one. Yeah. Good. Vessel. Right. You got it. Now you're going to see a 220 pound, 37 year old male. He complains of mid sternal chest pain, which began last night and has become worse throughout the night. Complains of nausea, headache, shortness of breath. He's also 10 out of 10, hypertensive, O2 sat, pulse good, uh, skin is clammy. Here's your EKG. Anteroseptal, right? Yep. Going to activate? Yep. yep. Blood vessel? And he does have some reciprocals over in the inferior side too, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. sure. You're dispatched to a 240 pound, 57 year old male, sitting in a chair, substernal chest pain, right arm and jaw pain, seven out of 10. Vitals all look good. He's pale and diaphoretic as well. Here's your EKG. What do you say? An anteroseptal? Yeah. Looks real. He's up a couple of boxes. Maybe a little reciprocal stuff inferiorly. So you're going to call us and activate or not activate? Yeah. Excellent. Which artery? LED. LED, you got it. That's the guy that goes into fibrillation and dies in front of you. Yeah. Um, you dispatch to a 200 pound, 76 year old male. He's five out of 10 chest pain. He's a little hypotensive at 84 over 53. Bradycardic, uh, skin is pale, diaphoretic. Lungs are clear bilaterally. Yeah. <laughs> Not subtle, right? I take it you're gonna, you're gonna send this guy? Why, why do you think he's hyper? Yeah, could be a left main or it's going to be a high LED. Um, so why is he hypotensive? His, pump, his pump's not pumping, right? His left, his left ventricle just ain't working, right? Yeah. Do you know how this guy did? Did he do okay? I think all of these were um, saves. All were success stories? Okay. This guy, this guy, I think I walked out with like a 50% injection. 
Wow. That is amazing. This guy 10 years ago would have, would have been a cardiac cripple when he left the hospital. If he left the hospital, right? You're dispatched to 175 pounds, 62 year old male, complains of pain in the center of my chest. Eight out of 10, hypertensive, pulse and sat are good. Skin color is normal, lung sounds are clear. So, what do you think? Inferior, okay. Activate, don't activate. Activate. Yeah, looks real to me. He's up in 2-3 up in ABF. He's got a little reciprocal V1, V2. Good. If it says that, make sure you take at least take a close look at it before you before you ignore it. Okay, which coronary artery? Which area of the heart? Right, and it's inferior. Yep. Now we got 135 pound. This might be a person who gets less than the 4,000 units. 135 pound, uh, 85 year old male, not feeling good. Pain is zero out of 10. Blood pressure, uh, pulse are good. He's a little tachypneic. O2 sat is marginal. Skin is clammy. He does have rails in both lungs. What do you see? What leaps out at you on this EKG? Bunch of PVCs, right? Okay, ignore the PVCs, look at his native beats. Activate, don't activate. Don't activate. If you ignore the PVCs, his STs are flat, right? There's, there's not any, any acute abnormality there. This one was activated. Uh, so this is one of the one of the misses that we have, uh, and it was activated because this beat has ST elevation. This beat has ST elevation, but those are PVCs. So the error here was not looking at the native beats, but calling ST elevation on a PVC. Two hundred and twenty pound, thirty seven year old male. He's got crushing chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, and headache. His pain is seven out of ten. He's quite hypertensive. Lungs are clear, skin color is normal. I think you can see that. Okay, good. Someone said anterior. Everyone agree with that? Yeah, okay. He's got an anterior MI. He's got some reciprocal changes in the inferior leaves, maybe a little depression. That's the, the T wave inversion over here laterally. So he's, an, he's a septal anterior MI. Artery? LED, got it. A 100 pound, 47 year old female dialysis patient. This should always raise a red flag with you. Complains of chest pain, eight out of 10, 165 over 91 pressure, pulse is a little high, breathing is labored, 83% O2 sat on a non-rebreather. What do you see? QRS is a little wide, right? Probably doesn't meet the criteria for true bundle branch block, but QRS is a little wide. What else leaps out at you? Yeah, you know, I think Dr. Selleck is going to go, has she spoken yet? She's going to go over more detail on LVH uh, and the rule of 35 and, and count in your boxes. But really, the poor man's way to look at it is if, if the QRS complexes are touching each other across the precordium, you probably got LVH. Uh, be very careful about activating on LVH. I think that's one of the things we're going to tell you not to activate on. Um, so this one was activated, and you certainly can argue that, yeah, if I find a baseline, I'm up, I'm up in two and three here. I may be up a little bit in four. I've got some ST, or I've got some T wave inversion out here in five and six. But the marked LVH is what should should say tell you maybe I shouldn't activate the lab on this. You're dispatched to 150 pound, 51 year old male, sitting upright in his chair, pressure in the center of my chest going down my left arm. It's about two out of 10. Vitals all look good, skin's a little clammy, lungs are clear. Is 
what do you make of this? He's got peak T waves, right? And he's got what's he got in what's he got inferiorly? Okay. So is this is this guy suspicious for a coronary syndrome? Yeah. Would you would you activate the cath lab? No. No. Right. He doesn't have ST elevation. He's got peak T waves. For extra credit, anyone know what those peak T waves are sometimes referred to as? You can call them hyperacute T waves. So this is a guy who, uh, addressing Chris McKellar's question, probably ought to have a repeat EKG in five to 10 minutes. These hyperacute Ts are the first change in the evolution of an MI. So there's a fair chance that this guy looks the part that you're gonna repeat his EKG in five or 10 minutes and now he's gonna have obvious ST elevation across the percordium. Uh, and if he develops that, then you're gonna activate. If he doesn't develop that, you're gonna call us and say, I got a guy who I think is a real cardiac patient. I've done all my interventions I need to do, but he's coming to the ER because he doesn't meet cath lab criteria. So this one was activated on? This is one of the ones that, that was activated, yeah. Yeah, usually EMS doesn't see those because yep. patients wait too long. Right. It's only within, what, the first 30 minutes? Oh yeah, the hyperacutes are very early, yep, yep. So did this guy, do you know what the outcome was? Does this guy have an LED lesion? Or do we even know? You know, I don't, I don't remember. I suspect he did. I suspect this was real. I suspect real. Those, those EKGs changed and actually ended up going. Can you go over um, why we've expanded our program into q waves and also the right bundle branches and maybe a little bit of why we're given the heparin and how that helps Dr. Lawler because he's not going to have a chance to talk about how the heparin will soften. Well, that's, the, that, that's exactly it. It's an, it's an anticoagulant. Uh, it'll inhibit the platelets. It'll stop, it'll stop the clot forming that's going on, you know, all the thrombin, all the laying down of clots, and that'll make it easier for him to get out, easier for him to suck out of the artery. Um, we're not given the antiplatelet agents, uh, I understand, because they can give the immediate acting ones in the cath lab, and they're just as effective. And if the patient turns out to not be re repairable by cath and needs a cabbage, you don't want him to have antiplatelets on board. Um, the main reason we've expanded uh, to Q waves and right bundle and even left bundle is because everyone's done such an excellent job with the regular stuff. Um, you guys have shown that you're capable, and uh, the more people we can help with this, the better. Thanks, you bet. Thanks.